Very good morning to you. I hope you're very well. Andrew Castle with you. The Metropolitan Police Service has paid compensation to retired Field Marshal Lord Bramall and the family of the late Lord Britton over false accusations of child sex abuse. Now, that doesn't even begin to tell the story, does it, of the personal effects of what has happened. Uh, The Met has not revealed the amount paid, but it is reported to be around about £100,000. So that's a big so what, isn't it? Both men were accused by a man known as Nick who is being investigated for perverting the course of justice. And this comes after the Met's child abuse investigation, Operation Midland, was criticised in a recent report. So, just for a moment, Lord Bramall, a Normandy veteran, retired from the House of Lords in 2013. He was accused of these offences in 2014. He's a former head of the army, a distinguished military man. His wife died before his name could be cleared. You'll know Lord Britton, a former Conservative Home Secretary. Allegations he raped a 19-year-old woman. All absolutely false. The credibility of this bloke, Nick, absolutely shot to pieces. And as I say, now he's under investigation for perverting the course of justice. Uh, So, anonymity in these cases. Why should somebody have... uh, Why shouldn't they have anonymity? Why why should you be dragged through the streets in some medieval fashion and have your life just trashed publicly? Your reputation, hard won, is easily lost. Should suspects be granted anonymity to prevent this from happening again? I'll start by saying absolutely it should. Look at what happened to, to Cliff Richard. This was ridiculous. All charges were dropped. That was an absolute circus. He says now that he still finds the whole thing incredibly traumatic, thinks about it all the time. And, of course, it affects you for the rest of your life. Tim Loughton is with us, Conservative MP for East Worthing and Shoreham, a former Minister for Children and Families. Joseph Cotry monson is here as well, a criminal defence lawyer at Mary Monson, solicitors, solicitors on Fleet Street, who specialises in sexual offences. So, Joseph, Tim, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Tim Loughton, if I could start with you first. Anonymity for those accused um your thoughts um morning andrew morning. well yes that we have something in law called a presumption of innocence and the problem with the cases that you mentioned and i speak as somebody who launched the government's action plan on child sexual exploitation has pushed for the whole inquiry on child historical child sex exploitation so this is a very very serious crime and in no way we're we trying to undermine the importance of it but equally we have a duty to treat somebody who has been accused uh, fairly and in the full rigours of the law and we have the case you mentioned cliff richard we also have the case of paul gambaccini who came in front of the home affairs select committee which i sit on and the story which he came out with a year of his life was effectively put on hold his career was almost completely destroyed and at great personal expense to himself whilst he was investigated by the the police never charged on bail for almost a year and then all charges were absolutely dropped and all of that was in the public domain and i'm afraid the police treated it as a, it became a sort of there's no smoke without um fire <clears throat> and despite being completely cleared paul gambaccini had that overhanging for a year and will have it overhanging the rest of his life and it should have been done confidentially and it should have been much done much more quickly um and his innocence should have been maintained until otherwise well that's unequivocal joseph cotry monson has great experience of these matters uh, joe good morning to you why are suspects named in the first place and do you think they should be Good morning, Andrew. Well, the, 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 there is actually a rationale, and it's not just to do with po- uh, naming and shaming. Although, as a defence lawyer, you'll see from what I say that I'm fairly uneasy about it. And the rationale says this. It's really a public interest argument, and that's that the publication of proceedings... Well, it a- it's actually been shown, and we can give you example. We can talk about examples today, to have had the effect of giving other victims of the same perpetrator the knowledge that people have come forward, the courage to come forward themselves. And, of course, that results in somebody getting the type of sentence that they should get rather than just get a fraction. We saw in the case, the very disturbing case of the disgraced TV personality, Stuart Hall, that more of his victims came forward after his arrest and charge and that he was convicted in the same trial of more offences which had been brought to light as a result of that publicity and indeed then in a subsequent trial. Uh, Now, the question is, does it mean that in all proceedings we should be blanket naming and shaming defendants? Of course, we've heard some very cogent argument as to why not. 
from uh, the, the learned MP. Now, it, it's difficult, but in my view, it can't be as binary as a choice between no publicity in any cases or, all, or publicity in all cases. What would we say, for example, of somebody who was accused of marital rape, being named and shamed? I'm not talking about a celebrity or a, a public dignitary who can go to a libel court afterwards and clear their name and put themselves more or less in, in a very similar position to the, world that we'd be, the one they were before. I'm talking about normal people who don't have access to these types of resources. And then that person gets acquitted. That's much less likely if publicized pre-trial to be of assistance to pol or during the trial to be of assistance to police in bringing more people forward and similarly someone who's accused of and then acquitted of child pornography well, public publicity in that in those cases it serves only to besmirch the, the, the besmirch the name of somebody who may be innocent and of course has no public interest benefit that I've described at all okay so the, uh, the you, what you're suggesting is it, it's a price worth paying in some cases to trash the reputation and the possible work life social life and, and family uh, life of someone in, in order to, to, to make headway in other areas you're I, saying that there is a balance here and some there's going to be some collateral damage I, I think it's very very difficult you know i'm a defense lawyer but i'm also an officer of the court and you know justice must be done and be seen to be done is something we're all taught in law school it's something that goes back it's something that goes back further than there are so many false precedences. accusations though joe so many there's anybody can make any allegation and if you happen to have a public profile like a cliff richard like a lord bramel uh, like a like a, a, a leon Britton, you know it's going to be front pages it's going to be front and center and it's going to kill people you know around you it's going to it's going to shatter a life andrew andrew welcome to my world you know these are cases where lives are ruined i see it regularly on the basis of an accusation uh, alone. I think there is an absolutely a case for reform. I, I think that once we talk about a polarised opinion of one way or the other without any sense of measure, then, then okay. you know, that's always bad law. And how do we bring a sense of measure to somebody's uh, credibility as, as a witness and as an accuser? Surely, uh, Tim Loughton, this, uh, this Nick, whoever he is, we can't wait to find out, was not properly assessed as a credible accuser in the first place in the, uh, in the case of uh, Bramall and Britain. Clearly, and that's part of the problem. And I will take issue with, with three points that Joseph mentioned there. He mentioned the case of Stuart Hall, where after he was charged, all sorts of people came, uh, came forward. The difference with Cliff Richard, Paul Gambaccini and others, they were not charged, and they were used, as Paul Gambaccini described himself, as human flypaper, where the police had very flimsy information on somebody who turned out to be a complete fantasist, and in order to try and boost their case... They put his name out there to try and get other people uh, to come forward when there was nobody else to come forward because he hadn't committed those, uh, those, those crimes. So until somebody is charged, it absolutely should not be in the public domain. Uh, Joseph also said that when you're dealing with somebody who may be innocent, in English law, as he will know, everyone has a, a, a right to be presumed innocent until he or she is found um, otherwise. And in these cases, these were all people who were not even charged. And then there's the whole celebrity uh, issue. If Leon Britton had been Leon Smith, it would not have hit the front um, pages. Because it was somebody in the public eye, the other cases are people in the public eye that many people will know, they're celebrities or politicians uh, or whatever, they should be treated absolutely no differently to anybody else in the eyes of the law. But clearly they are going to attract an awful lot of um, attention and their reputations and possibly their c careers will be undermined, besmirched or even um, ruined without any further evidence leading to them actually being uh, charged. That just cannot be fair. And whether we like it or not, and however heinous the crimes that are alleged uh, are, those people who are being accused are entitled to that presumption of innocence and confidentiality, at least until they have been charged. And there is a sufficiently strong case for the police to uh, believe that these offences have been committed and that evidence is available from credible people. That was just not the case here. And the, and the biggest crime, I think, by the, the police was taking so long, a whole year with Paul Gambaccini, Cliff Richard, to get, uh, however long that, uh, that law, that, that it, it took. 22 to months, I think. Hung out to dry. 
Mm. OK, Tim Loughton, thank you very much indeed. A last word uh, to you, Joseph Cotri monson just uh, in, uh, in, a minute, in, in a minute or so. Are the penalties severe enough to deter people who would make a false accusation? Well, I, I, I mean, the, the reality is that it's, the police will always be reluctant to, to make those prosecutions. We saw a horrific case of a woman who made a- allegations against 15 people who, are, who got a 10-year sentence, quite rightly. But, you know, yes, these, I was heartened those, by that. Those cases are vanishingly rare. And, and the, the reality is that false accusations are something that exists much more commonly than any of the net public narrative will accept. I, you know, I, I, I do want to, to correct something. I mean, I, there is no way that I would suggest for a minute that, uh, that, that I, I regard somebody when I say that they may be innocent uh, as anything in the, uh, except innocent in the, the eyes of the law. You know, I'm, I'm expressing this in the context of what the readers must, uh, the listeners must be thinking. But I, I think also, I think Tim and I agree probably more than more than he recognises because all of a sudden he is making a proposal. Okay, well let's look at post charge. Certainly pre-charge identity shouldn't be published. Well, all of a sudden we're talking about sensible measures. Which, which discriminate between different types of circumstance. That's what I'm suggesting. Okay. I'm suggesting greater regulation but as part of a conversation that, 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 that is starting to begin now, sensible conversation, so that sensible reform can be brought about. Joseph Cotri-Monson, thank you very much indeed. And to Tim Loughton, my thanks as well.